One day, and that day was many years ago now, I received a long, chatty letter from one of my old chums and fellow wanderers in eastern waters. He was still out there, but settled down and middle-aged. I imagined him, grown portly in figure and domestic in his habits. In short, overtaken by the fate common to all except to those who, being specially beloved by the gods, get knocked on the head early. The letter was of the reminiscent do you remember kind, a wistful letter of backward glances, and amongst other things, surely you remember old Nelson, he wrote. Remember old Nelson, certainly, and to begin with his name was not Nelson. The Englishmen of the archipelago called him Nelson because it was more convenient, I suppose, and he never protested. It would have been mere pedantry. The true form of his name was Nielsen. He had come out east long before the advent of telegraph cables, had served English firms, had married an English girl, and had been one of us for years, trading and sailing in all directions through the eastern archipelago, across and around, transversely, diagonally, perpendicularly, in semicircles and zigzags and figures of eight for years and years. There was no nook or cranny of these tropical waters that the enterprise of old Nelson had not penetrated in an eminently pacific way. His tracks, if plotted out, would have covered the map of the archipelago like a cobweb, all of it, with the sole exception of the Philippines. He would never approach that part from a strange dread of Spaniards, or to be exact, of the Spanish authorities. What he imagined they could do to him, it is impossible to say. Perhaps at some time in his life he had read some stories of the Inquisition. But he was, in general, afraid of what he called authorities, not the English authorities, which he trusted and respected, but the other two of that part of the world. He was not so horrified at the Dutch as he was at the Spaniards, but he was even more mistrustful of them, very mistrustful indeed. The Dutch, in his view, were capable of playing any ugly trick on a man who had the misfortune to displease them. There were their laws and regulations, but they had no notion of fair play in applying them. It was really pitiable to see the anxious circumspection of his dealings with some official or other, and remember that this man had been known to stroll up to a village of cannibals in New Guinea in a quiet, fearless manner, and note that he was always fleshy all his life, and, if I may so, an appetizing morsel. On some matter of barter that did not amount, perhaps, to fifty pounds in the end. Remember old Nelson, rather, truly. None of us in my generation had known him in his active days. He was retired in our time. He had brought, or else leased, part of a small island from the sultan of a little group called the Seven Isles, not far north from Banka. It was, I suppose, a legitimate transaction, and I have no doubt that had he been an Englishman, the Dutch would have discovered a reason to fire him out without ceremony. In this connection, the real form of his name stood him in good stead. In the character of an unassuming Dane, whose conduct was most correct, they let him be. With all his money engaged in cultivation, he was naturally careful not to give even the shadow of offense and it was mostly for prudential reasons of that sort that he did not look with a favorable eye on Jasper Allen, but of that later, yes. One remembered well enough old Nelson's big, hospitable bungalow, erected on a shelving point of land, his portly form, costumed generally in a white shirt and trousers, he had a confirmed habit of taking off his alpaca jacket on the slightest provocation. His round blue eyes, his straggly sand-white mustache sticking out 
always like the quills of the fretful porcupine, his propensity to sit down suddenly and fan himself with his hat, but there is no use concealing the fact that what one remembered really was his daughter, who at the time came out to live with him and be a sort of lady of the isles. Freya Nelson was the kind of girl one remembers. The oval of her face was perfect, and within that fascinating frame, the most happy disposition of line and feature with an admirable complexion gave an impression of health, strength, and what I might call unconscious self-confidence, a most pleasant and, as it were, whimsical determination. I will not compare her eyes to violets, because the real shade of their color was peculiar, not so dark and more lustrous. They were of the wide-open kind, and looked at one frankly in every mood. I never did see the long, dark eyelashes lowered. I dare say Jasper Allen did, being a privileged person, but I have no doubt that the expression must have been charming in a complex way. She could, Jasper told me once, with a touchingly imbecile exaltation, sit on her hair. I dare say, I dare say. It was not for me to behold these wonders. I was content to admire the neat and becoming way she used to do it up, so as not to conceal the good shape of her head. And this wealth of hair was so glossy that when the screens of the west veranda were down, making a pleasant twilight there, or in the shade of the grove of fruit trees near the house, it seemed to give out a golden light of its own. She dressed generally in a white frock, with a skirt of walking length, showing her neat, laced, brown boots. If there was any color about her costume, it was just a bit of blue, perhaps. No exertion seemed to distress her. I have seen her land from the dinghy after a long pull in the sun. She rode herself about a good deal, with no quickened breath, and not a single hair out of place. In the morning, when she came out on the veranda for the first look westward, Sumatra way, over the sea, she seemed as fresh and sparkling as a dewdrop. But a dewdrop is evanescent, and there was nothing evanescent about Freya. I remember her round, solid arms with the fine wrists and her broad, capable hands with tapering fingers. I don't know whether she was actually born at sea, but I do know that up to twelve years of age she sailed about with her parents in various ships. After old Nelson lost his wife, it became a matter of serious concern for him what to do with the girl. A kind lady in Singapore, touched by his dumb grief and deplorable perplexity, offered to take charge of Freya. This arrangement lasted some six years, during which old Nelson retired and established himself on his island, and then it was settled, the kind lady going away to Europe, that his daughter should join him. As the first and most important preparation for that event, the old fellow ordered from his Singapore agent a stain in Abart's upright grand. I was then commanding a little steamer in the island trade, and it fell to my lot to take it out to him, so I know something of Freya's upright grand. We landed the enormous packing case with difficulty on a flat piece of rock amongst some bushes, nearly knocking the bottom one of one of my boats in the course of the nautical operation. Then all my crew, assisting engineers and firemen included, by the exercise of much anxious ingenuity, and by means of rollers, levers, tackles, and inclined planes of soaked planks, toiled in the sun like ancient Egyptians at the building of a pyramid. We got it as far as the house and up to the edge of the west veranda, which was the actual drawing room of the bungalow. There the case being ripped off cautiously, the beautiful rosewood monster stood revealed at last. 
In reverent excitement, we coaxed it against the wall and drew the first free breath of the day. It was certainly the heaviest movable object on that islet since the creation of the world. The volume of sound it gave out in that bungalow, which acted as a sounding board, was really astonishing. It thundered sweetly right over the sea. Jasper Allen told me that early of a morning on the deck of the Bonito, his wonderfully fast and pretty brig, he could hear Freya playing her scales quite distinctly. But the fellow always anchored foolishly close to the point, as I told him more than once. Of course, these seas are almost uniformly serene, and the Seven Isles is a particularly calm and cloudless spot as a rule. But still, now and again, an afternoon thunderstorm over Banca, or even one of these vicious thick squalls from the distant Sumatra coast would make a sudden sally upon the group, enveloping it for a couple of hours in whirlwinds and bluish-black murk of a particularly sinister aspect. Then, with the lowered rattan screens rattling desperately in the wind and the bungalow shaking all over, Freya would sit down to the piano and play fierce Wagner music in the flicker of blinding flashes, with thunderbolts falling all around, enough to make your hair stand on end, and Jasper would remain stock still on the veranda, adoring the back view of her supple, swaying figure, the miraculous sheen of her fair head, the rapid hands on the keys, the white nape of her neck, while the brig, down at that point there, surged at her cables within a hundred yards of nasty, shiny, black rockheads. Uff! And this, if you please, for no reason but that, when he went on board at night and laid his head on the pillow, he should feel that he was as near as he could conveniently get to his Freya, slumbering in the bungalow. Did you ever? And mind, this brig was the home to be, their home, the floating paradise which he was gradually fitting out like a yacht to sail his life blissfully away in with Freya, imbecile. But the fellow was always taking chances. One day, I remember I watched with Freya on the veranda, the brig approaching the point from the northward. I suppose Jasper made the girl out with his long glass. What does he do? Instead of standing on for another mile and a half along the shoals, and then tacking for the anchorage in a proper and seamanlike manner, he spies a gap between two disgusting old jagged reefs, puts the helm down suddenly, and shoots the brig through, with all her sails shaking and rattling, so that we could hear the racket on the veranda. I drew my breath through my teeth, I can tell you, and Freya swore. Yes, she clenched her capable fists, and stamped her pretty brown boot and said, Damn! Then, looking at me with a little heightened color, not much, she remarked, I forgot you were there, and laughed. To be sure, to be sure. When Jasper was in sight, she was not likely to remember that anybody else in the world was there. In my concern at this mad trick, I couldn't help appealing to her sympathetic common sense. Isn't he a fool, I said with feeling. Perfect idiot, she agreed warmly, looking at me straight with her wide-open, earnest eyes and the dimple of a smile on her cheek. And that, I pointed out to her, just to save twenty minutes or so in meeting you. We heard the anchor go down, and then she became very resolute and threatening. Wait a bit, I'll teach him. She went into her own room and shut the door, leaving me alone on the veranda with my instructions. Long before the brig's sails were furled, Jasper came up three steps at a time, forgetting to say, How do you do? and looking right and left eagerly. Where's Freya? Wasn't she here just now? When I explained to him that he 
was to be deprived of Miss Freya's presence for a whole hour, just to teach him. He said I had put her up to it, no doubt, and that he feared he would have yet to shoot me some day. She and I was getting too thick together. Then he flung himself into a chair and tried to talk to me about this trip. But the funny thing was that the fellow actually suffered. I could see it. His voice failed him, and he sat there dumb, looking at the door with the face of a man in pain. Fact, and the next still funnier thing was that the girl calmly walked out of her room in less than ten minutes, and then I left. I mean to say that I went away to seek old Nelson on the back veranda, which was his own special nook in the distribution of that house, with the kind of purpose of engaging him in conversation, lest he should start roaming about and intrude unwittingly where he was not wanted just then. He knew that the brig had arrived, though he did not know that Jasper was already with his daughter. I suppose he didn't think it was possible in the time. A father naturally wouldn't. He suspected that Alan was sweet on his girl, the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea, most of the traders in the archipelago, and all sorts and conditions of men in the town of Singapore were aware of it, but he was not capable of appreciating how far the girl was gone on the fellow. He had an idea that Freya was too sensible to ever be gone on anybody. I mean to an unmanageable extent. No, it was not that which made him sit on the back veranda and worry himself in his unassuming manner during Jasper's visits. What he worried about were the Dutch authorities, for it is a fact that the Dutch looked askance at the doings of Jasper Allen, owner and master of the brig Bonito. They considered him much too enterprising in his trading. I don't know that he ever did anything illegal, but it seems to me that his immense activity was repulsive to their stolid character and slow-going methods. Anyway, in old Nelson's opinion, the captain of the Benito was a smart sailor and a nice young man, but not a desirable acquaintance upon the whole. Somewhat compromising, you understand? On the other hand, he did not like to tell Jasper in so many words to keep away. Poor old Nelson himself was a nice fellow. I believe he would have shrunk from hurting the feelings even of a mop-headed cannibal, unless perhaps under very strong provocation. I mean the feelings, not the bodies. As against spears, knives, hatchets, clubs, or arrows, old Nelson had proved himself capable of taking his own part. In every other respect, he had a timorous soul. So he sat on the back veranda with a concerned expression, and whenever the voices of his daughter and Jasper Allen reached him, he would blow out his cheeks and let the air escape with a dismal sound, like a much-tried man. Naturally, I derided his fears, which he, more or less, confided to me. He had a certain regard for my judgment, and a certain respect. Not for my moral qualities, however, but for the good terms I was supposed to be on with the Dutch authorities. I knew for a fact that his greatest bugbear, the governor of Banca, a charming, peppery, hardy, retired rear admiral, had a distinct liking for him. This consoling assurance, which I used always to put forward, made old Nelson brighten up for a moment, but in the end he would shake his head doubtfully, as much as to say that this was all very well, but that there were depths in the Dutch official nature which no one but himself had ever fathomed, perfectly ridiculous. On this occasion I am speaking of, old Nelson was even Freddy. For a while I was trying to entertain him with a very funny and somewhat scandalous adventure which happened to a certain acquaintance of ours in Saigon, he exclaimed suddenly, what the devil he wants to turn up here for. Clearly he had not heard a word of the anecdote, and this annoyed me. 
because the anecdote was really good. I stared at him. Come, come, I cried. Don't you know what Jasper Allen is turning up here for? This was the first open allusion I had ever made to the true state of affairs between Jasper and his daughter. He took it very calmly. Oh, Freya is a sensible girl, he murmured absently, his mind's eye obviously fixed on the authorities. No, Freya was no fool. He was not concerned about that. He didn't mind it in the least. The fellow was just company for her. He amused the girl, nothing more. When the perspicacious old chap left off mumbling, all was still in the house. The other two were amusing themselves very quietly, and no doubt very heartily. What more absorbing and less noisy amusement could they have found than to plan their future? Side by side on the veranda they must have been looking at the brig, the third party in that fascinating game. Without her there would have been no future. She was the future in the home, and the great free world for them. Who was it that likened a ship to a prison? May I be ignominiously hanged at a yard arm if that's true. The white sails of that craft were the white wings. Pinions, I believe, would be the more poetical style. Well, the white pinions of their soaring love. Soaring as regards Jasper. Freya, being a woman, kept a better hold of the mundane connections of this affair. But Jasper was elevated in the true sense of the word ever since the day when, after they had been gazing at the brig, in one of those decisive silences that alone establish a perfect communion between creatures gifted with speech, he proposed that she should share the ownership of that treasure with him. Indeed, he presented the brig to her altogether, but then his heart was in the brig since the day he bought her in Manila from a certain middle-aged Peruvian in a sober suit of black broadcloth, enigmatic and sententious, who, for all I know, might have stolen her on the South American coast, whence he said he had come over to the Philippines for family reasons. This, for family reasons, was distinctly good. No true cabulero would care to push on inquiries after such a statement. Indeed, Jasper was quite the caballero. The brig herself was then all black and enigmatical, and very dirty, a tarnished gem of the sea, or rather a neglected work of art. For he must have been an artist, the obscure builder who had put her body together on lovely lines out of the hardest tropical timber, fastened with the purest copper. Goodness only knows, in what part of the world she was built. Jasper himself had not been able to ascertain much of her history from his sententious, saturnine Peruvian, if the fellow was a Peruvian, and not the devil himself in disguise, as Jasper jocularly pretended to believe. My opinion is that she was old enough to have been one of the last pirates, a slave perhaps, or else an opium clipper of the early days, if not an opium smuggler. However that may be, she was as sound as on the day she first took the water, sailed like a witch, steered like a little boat, and, like some fair women of adventurous life famous in history, seemed to have the secret of perpetual youth, so that there was nothing unnatural in Jasper Allen treating her like a lover, and the treatment restored the luster of her beauty. He clothed her in many coats of the very best white paint so skillfully, carefully, artistically, put on and kept clean by his badgered crew of picked melees, that no costly enamel such as jewelers use for their work could have looked better and felt smoother to the touch. A narrow gilt molding defined her elegant sheen as she sat on the water, eclipsing easily the professional good looks of any pleasure craft that ever came to the East in those days. For myself, I must say, 
I prefer a molding of deep crimson color on a white hull. It gives a stronger relief, besides being less expensive, and I told Jasper so. But no, nothing less than the best gold leaf would do, because no decoration could be gorgeous enough for the future abode of his Freya. His feelings for the Brig and for the girl was as indissolubly united in his heart as you may fuse two precious metals together in one crucible, and the flame was pretty hot, I can assure you. It induced in him a fierce inward restlessness, both of activity and desire. Too fine in face, with a lateral wave in his chestnut hair, spare, long-limbed, with an eager glint in his steely eyes and quick, brusque movements, he made me think sometimes of a flashing sword blade perpetually leaping out of the scabbard. It was only when he was near the girl, when he had her there to look at, that this peculiarly tense attitude was replaced by a grave, devout watchfulness of her slightest movements and utterances. Her cool, resolute, capable, good-humored self-possession seemed to steady his heart. Was it the magic of her face, of her voice, of her glances which calmed him so? Yet these were the very things, one must believe, which had set his imagination ablaze. If love begins in imagination, but I am no man to discuss such mysteries. And it strikes me that we have neglected poor old Nelson, inflating his cheeks in a state of worry on the back veranda. I pointed out to him, after all, Jasper was not a very frequent visitor. He and his brig worked hard all over the archipelago. But all old Nelson said, and he said it uneasily, was, I hope Himskirk won't turn up here while the brig's about. Getting up a scare about Heemskirk now. Heemskirk, really. One hadn't the patience. 